I was later then on in smart manufacturing, and the conclusion of the session was we need to reskill and re educate all of our workers. This morning I was in the uh, session on future of work, and guess what? They were talking about the fact that we need to educate people uh, for that new world where business will be very different. And then uh, when I was in the session on the uh, Bing Duong province uh, investments uh, just before lunch, uh, I saw there that they work with a triple helix concept where government, business, and guess what, educational institutions will work together. So this is huge expectation about um, what education can do uh, to almost save the world, uh, or to at least help us in the transition that is ongoing in the world. But at the same time, what I hear is that uh, in these sessions, and actually also in other places, is that the current traditional forms of education are perhaps not living up to that expectation. That uh, we need to find um, that, that we need to find different ways for upskilling adults, and that adult learning is probably very different from traditional uh, K to 12 and university education. Uh, that we need to find different ways of delivery, be it online or through more experiential learning. Uh, and, that, and that was in the brief for the session, and as a chairman I will stick to my brief, uh, is that we have to also uh, make sure that our students or, or the beneficiaries of the education, let me call them that way, that they develop a more critical spirit, that a critical attitude. Uh, and also uh, in the brief for this session was that there perhaps needs to more, a, more of a contextual approach that we need to adapt our educational systems to the context in which they operate uh, and that we also need to have a stronger support for mathematics, science, technology, uh, engineering, uh, that we strongly, that we need people with that background. So that is the, the background against which we have this session. High expectations, but perhaps the traditional forms of uh, education, which I represent here, uh, the, tradi the traditional forms of education do not live up to our expectations. We have uh, seven people around the table that can bring us uh, some insights in what that innovation is all about. And uh, I was uh, going to ask them, or I am going to ask them to uh, sort of do an introduction. Uh, as I said, a two-liner about uh, where they come from or what their institution, what their institution, what they're all about. And then secondly, uh, perhaps talk about what's innovative in what they try to achieve, where do they differentiate themselves from uh, other uh, suppliers of education. I was going to talk or start with a colleague of mine, uh, Irene, if you can start, uh, because we come both from a university, so let's start with the more traditional forms of education. Good afternoon, everyone. Firstly, I'd like to express and share my joy and happiness in mingling and interacting with, uh, with you guys, our Asian friends. I am Dr. Irene Ardevilla, currently the Dean of the College of Accountancy, Business, Tourism, and International Hospitality Management of the University of Batangas. That's two and a half hours uh, away from Manila. And uh, just a trivia, since I'm in the tourism also, it is where the smallest active volcano in the world can be found. And uh, I am likewise the board secretary of the Philippine Association of Collegiate Schools of Business with 300 members in the Philippines. Uh, as for my university, it is a stock non-sectarian private educational institution and it caters to the holistic needs of students in the areas of business, education, technology, engineering, tourism and hospitality, criminal justice, liberal arts, other areas of learning. We also have uh, graduate school and law school. As to the innovations uh, or, or the major in initiatives of the university, we offer curricular programs that are attuned with the needs of the times and uh, in consonance with the regional and national trust of the government. Uh, UB, as in its 72 years of existence, subject itself to periodic assessments and accreditation by proper accrediting bodies and in fact, this coming December, we will be awarded with three programs. That is number one, 
top four in the country with the highest number of accredited programs, and number two, top three in the region with the highest number of accredited programs, and number three, uh, the institution with ISO 9001 version 2015 certification. Uh, another innovation that I'd like, like to talk about is we prepare a high caliber of uh, scientific and technological programs incorporating advances, latest trends, and teaching methods and procedures wherein it is infused in our academic curriculum starting off from the primary up to the postgraduate level. Um, our institution is likewise um, responded to the challenge in education sector by shifting from the previous 10-year compulsory basic education system to a K-12 structure. It has incorporated student-centered learning and an outcome-based curriculum and deepening focus on internationalization. Uh, as part of the internationalization initiative, we have partnered with Australian Skills Institute for the Diploma of Leadership and Management in which our students uh, were given the opportunity to earn uh, Australian qualifications without leaving their home country. We likewise adhered to the ASEAN Mutual Recognition Arrangement or the ASEAN MRA on tourism professionals. And uh, as to the question, what needs to be done to reorient Asia's educational institutions towards more uh, innovation, um, we propose reorientation, examination of values, principles, goals, and understanding uh, in terms of regional integration and friendly coexistence. We would like to also have a united Asian community forging academic alliances among Asian uh, countries and uh, espousing innovation and aspiring for the welfare of all. Uh, that would be all for me. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, Interesting that you talk about partnerships uh, to improve the education. Uh, maybe to not say that I stay with traditional approaches, but uh, Cam, you are running a school that tries to be different from very traditional schools in, uh, in Myanmar. Moving from the Philippines to Myanmar, perhaps you can give us some indication. And it would be nice that we don't hear the telephones ringing. Thank you. Hello. Um, my name is Cameron Sabo. Um, I'm one of the founders of Talon International School in Yangon, Myanmar. Um, it is a mid-market school. Uh, we're in our third year of existence as a school that serves both the international and local communities. Um, one of the challenges that we have is students that are coming from the government schools um, are used to a very rote style of education. The teacher speaks, the students respond exactly as the teacher said. So when they come to our school, um, they have to learn to think, to question. And with that, we have a lot of challenges. Um, we do emphasize um, respect of the local culture as well as um, internationalness in the education. So we celebrate local holidays um, and we have a Myanmar studies for both local and international students. So we believe in uh, first language acquisition for the Myanmar students that they continue and uh, Myanmar language for second language or third language speakers. Um, to give you a little bit of context of where Myanmar is, it's probably 10, 15 years behind Vietnam in terms of development, both um, infrastructure as well as education. Um, so with that, we work on IT um, as well as um, some of the IT STEM type of concepts, uh, which I'll talk about in a moment. One of the challenges that we have as a school is educating parents, not just the students. Parents often um, are focused on just the exams 
and they just want to know what the score is. So uh, they sometimes think the SAT is a curriculum as opposed to um, it's a test that is used for university. So we have lots of challenges and we're developing in that. Um, in terms of myself, I, my background actually was mathematics. Um, I have a master's in math in discrete area. Did I be um, AP, and which is related to STEM. And STEM is science, technology, engineering, mathematics. And the mathematics that is taught today is very different from 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. It's a lot more um, applications and understanding of the concepts. And so that to me is actually very exciting because that's the future of education. Um, the same is true with statistics. Um, in statistics, um, one area that's been interesting is looking at local data and integrating that into the courses. So with that, um, it's exciting to see MIAMA developing in this, and not just our school, but all the schools. And one additional aspect of STEM is actually turning into STEAM, where there is now science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics. And so there's an integration of art into uh, the curriculum and into the program. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Respect for local culture, culture educating parents, which can be in a, a real hurdle for this change in education uh, and mathematics in a different perspective from STEM to STEAM uh, are the three themes that I hear there. Moving to uh, somebody else who is in sort of more traditional schools uh, but with a different approach, uh, um, Atul, can I have your opinions? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Atul. I come from Singapore. Uh, I have co-founded a foundation called Global Schools Foundation. Um, I had no background in education. I happened to be in IBM handling their Asia Pacific business and I happened to accidentally tumble upon an education opportunity to provide education for community. And while traditional schools have been providing education, international schools as well, uh, but always, affordability always becomes a big question mark on every parent's mindset. Uh, you have two children, three children, you start calculating what's the annual fees going to be. And it is always a pinch on most of the families. So one of the, uh, one of the opportunities we saw was to really come out with an uh, international school that can be affordable. And uh, when we talked about the uh, school fees, people actually thought these jokers are going to go out of the market very soon because they don't know what they're talking. And especially because I came from IBM background, they said this is a technocrat, he has no idea what he's talking. But I think our team did a fantastic job. We managed to convince and put together a school in Singapore, uh, which was known as the Global Indian School. And soon we started uh, programs for International Baccalaureate, Cambridge, IGCSE, uh, we launched another brand called One World International School, and soon over the last uh, 17, 18 years, we've managed to take the schools on the same format, which is high quality but very affordable. And this is a model that is really, really uh, see seeing a lot of demand. In many countries we talk about, including Vietnam, India, Thailand, uh, and, and even in Singapore, for example, uh, that now the government has come up with new requirements for international school. And uh, if you can match the price uh, of, let's say, half of what other schools are charging, then uh, you have a very good chance to offer a school in Singapore. So we did that very recently. But uh, talking about uh, organization, I will just take two minutes, and then I'll come to the topic of the day, uh, which is many schools in our opinion, tend to be very highly disorganized and disoriented. One of the reasons is many of these are family-led initiatives, friends and families come together and do it. And as a reason, a lot of professional input probably is missed out. I'm not saying it's not there, they're very well-run schools, but a lot of professional things like 
for example, having metrics for performance measurement, whether it is students or whether it is uh, the, uh, the teachers, uh, we brought in a complete sweep of metrics across the board by implementing something called Malcolm Baldrige uh, Education Excellence Model from US. And we have been benchmarking our schools every year, at least 10 times a year, with various national agencies from various countries. And I'm glad to share with you that we are the only school in the world which has received about 108 national and international awards which are done by these national agencies. Uh, secondly, we also created something very interesting which is called a culture index. You know, when you go to a school, you have a certain opinion about how you describe a school as a parent or as a student. But we said the school needs to inculcate a culture. We all agree on that, but we never had a mechanism to structureize it, formalize it, which we did. And so we launched a culture index across all our campuses, which measure every year the culture index of that particular campus. And it is with respect to what you are trying to achieve and what you have achieved. And that index is a scientific index, which allows us to do a, a non-biased uh, uh, index. The other things we did was, uh, as you know, future skills, uh, a lot of talent, a lot of uh, education institutions, including universities, have always been talking about, we want children to be away from just team, but also show us evidence of excellence in areas of leadership, in areas of community service, in areas of uh, how they can multitask, how they can multiply in different situations and adapt to the situations. So we launched a very extensive skills program, uh, a total set of 38 skills that we have launched in the schools, uh, which include from very traditional, the dance and the music, and the classical music and languages, etc. But in addition to that, we have very, very simple things like culinary labs. So students actually are learning to cook food. I had a I had a founder of a big private equity from China recently visit us, and he said, you know what, we just forgot to cook food at home. Uh, many of our young children don't even cook it, they don't know how to cook it. But anyway, this is, I think, it's part of our skills that we want to imbibe on. Uh, green and conservation is a very important skill that we want to leave with. It's not just an initiative, but it's a mindset issue that we want to bring in. Uh, we have things like radio station and TV stations within the, studio, within the schools, but they are basically allowing children to develop their talents about mass communications and, and uh, overall personality development and things like digital design, et cetera. Of course, we also have, uh, we have to live with what the current days are. Uh, everybody wants to teach programming and, and coding in kindergartens. We don't think it's really appropriate. You know, you need to first do ABCD, then you go and do programming and coding. But what we've created is an age-appropriate program, which is able to uh, very, very subtly take these kids into those areas without really being told that you are doing a coding or a programming. So we employ a couple of market products which allow us to do that, and I think what we see is overall, it's a very metrics-driven organization that we've created. Thank you. Metrics-driven organizations to make sure that education remains affordable. Talking about affordable uh, education, Ajit, you come from a very different uh, part of the world. Uh. Thank you. Can, you can, can everybody hear me well? Um, uh, thank you. Uh, it's an it's, it's, uh, um, honor to be amongst the panelists here. To, uh, to give you a little background about myself, um, I am not as involved in the education sector as uh, most of you here are. I do sit on two boards of uh, two schools. My background is we are in an investment company in Nepal. We're in real estate, pharma, healthcare, and IT. Uh, the two experiences uh, that I want to share about my involvement in the education sector is I sit on two very different boards. One is at the board of the British School in Nepal, and the other one is the board of uh, a charity school where students don't have to pay. We collect funds for them, and uh, basically today we educate about 2,600 kids in that school. So. Um, <clears throat> I, I wanted to share a few, the, a few of the things that has worked for us, what we've done differently. Um, so the, the fact that we can, um, we ha have companies and um, the, the experience that we can bring from the students, um, we, we've started 
something similar to internships. I can't really say an in internship for high schools, but for um, especially when, when, you, when you're done with grade 12 and you have to wait almost a year for your results, there's a lot of time free. And what we do is we have these kids try to intern in most of our companies. So that's something that we've done differently. In, in our schools, we've, we've also done um, given preference to uh, computer labs, where, whereby uh, there is um, <clears throat> there's a chance um, for them to look at things like Khan Academy, or and there, there's a lot of interactive uh, learning tools uh, out there. So that's that's what we've done differently from uh, the other schools. And um, the, the dichotomy between these two schools is one, the, the, I, I serve on the board of the British school whereby these, the, the children who go, to, who go to that school are mostly from the privileged uh, family. Uh, so they've got at least the standard best of the best are, uh, uh, available out there. And on this uh, social school, it's very different. So we're trying to see, okay, how can we get uh, the content and the experience of this British school into the social school that we're trying to operate. So there's a lot of, we, we try to copy some things, but then again, the, the uh, money is, uh, is the issue. And um, <clears throat> uh, I think uh, in, I've, I've noticed uh, there's a lot of, um, um, there, there, there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's, it used to be a very passive way of um, teaching in the past, but now teachers are, I mean, are very different from when I went to school. They're more like mentors and coaches and all that stuff. And we're trying to uh, do the same thing for our social school as well. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Um, sort of, uh, we talked about affordability and that was the reason why I went, uh, made the link to Nepal, uh, but also the idea of bringing uh, experience from companies into the classroom, making it a much more active uh, type of education is important. Which leads me to another observation that I made, that is education, until now we have heard about schools, but education, of course, is not limited to schools. Uh, parents educate, uh, I hope so. Uh, companies educate, uh, or governments uh, engage in, in sort of education. So perhaps we should broaden a little bit uh, the idea of education to other types of institutions and therefore I want to bring Balangi in now. Yes. Hello, I am Marie. I am from the Philippines and my organization stands for Shelter, Education, Ecology, Disease Prevention and Service. What do we do? Okay, for education, we have gathered and codified the five disappearing languages in the Cordilleras by collecting their origin stories. With these, we were able to work with the Department of Education and we had made it into a textbook, specifically for the lower years, grades one till four, so that they will know where they come from and they will have a, a sense of belongingness. Secondly, we also support indigenous knowledge systems. And this one will be a little bit difficult for some. We have decolonization curriculum. Uh, we also follow Waldorf, Montessori, and the Pickler methods, which already incorporate as early as three years old. But we are aiming to transition to four uh, age levels before they hit kindergarten to grade 12, which is one of the innovations we are currently doing. And also we have incorporated mindfulness into our preschool. We have checked uh, before and after. The before is when the kids come in, we notice how they all work, how they have their focus, and then we try only one minute of meditation. We're in we tell the kids that you just have to be quiet, you sit down. And we have already noticed some anxieties among children, one of which is, of course, separation anxiety. The second one is they prefer to have light in the room. And the third one is they like to have their eyes open. And these are certain things that we are observing so that we know how to further address the situations. And with that, we have seen that with meditation, we have increased their focus time from the usual 20 seconds. Now, they after, right after meditation, they can 
focus for 30 minutes. So we are already looking at increasing the time of meditation to maybe five minutes, and then we will incorporate uh, yoga into the program. The, in the other innovations that we are doing, we are having a participatory education with parents and the community. For instance, we have already worked with the Department of Social Welfare and Development for positive parenting, and we are also setting up a resource sharing, in which case we are targeting uh, a cooperative with space, and that they will give us that space to build a preschool wherein five uh, communities around that area who do not have the necessary area will be educated in our center. Then secondly, we are targeting third culture kids. Uh, in the process of that, we are looking at music and art so that we can see where we ground them and then we can further their development in terms of learning. Fourthly, we are looking at cooperative education. This is a new program in the Philippines. And fifth, I would say we would be doing um, the community healing, which is something that not a lot of people are involved with. We go to a community, we learn their stories, and then the, the traumatic experience of that community, we had done this for World War II areas, and what we have seen with that is that once we have done the community healing, the school and the children become more focused. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's interesting to see that you use the communities as yes. a source of education or as, as in a, a way of educating, which leads us to uh, different ways of uh, delivering education. And we have three groups that, or three representatives here that actually talk about uh, different ways, online education, different ways of delivering uh, education. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, you, uh, then move to uh, uh, Jim, and then to uh, Ling. So, um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Janine. So, I hate self-education, and we create educational ed education technology products mainly targeted for um, children and youth who do not go to school or are in under-resourced areas. So, I guess my context is a little bit different. Uh, there are close to a billion um, children and youth that either uh, don't go to school or um, are going to school where teachers don't turn up for work, right? And in where I'm based, um, Indonesia, there are 20 million child laborers. So you can imagine that, uh, you know, uh, while there are people who can afford to go to international schools or think about higher education, but there is quite a big amount of um, people in Asia, uh, where we mainly work, Asia and Africa, right, that don't get a chance to. So. We, we, we want to think about it differently. So how can we educate these people where they can't go to school because of economic reasons, cultural reasons, infrastructure reasons, etc. So um, we, we saw a very golden opportunity through mobile phones and particularly through low-end Android devices. So that's how we started um, our journey. Um, so we create educational game apps that facilitate self-learning. So basically our um, students are able to learn on their own. Um, our work um, is um, separated into three areas. Um, first, we build on the fundamental skills. Then we look at um, job-specific skills and eventually um, link them up with employment. So we kind of think about that uh, as a whole kind, uh, whole package. <laughs> um, and so in terms of the uh, major innovations on our side, um, so we all know that education technology is not new, but um, we probably also know that uh, the massive open online courses have a completion rate uh, of, you know, one to two percent industry average, right? So we know that there's an engagement issue. So what we have done um, that's radically different um, is that uh, we assume zero motivation. So usually, ag tech products are created assuming that there's intrinsic motivation to learn. Um, and so we, we said, well, we just assume that our kids don't even want to learn, and how do we engage them? So just by like turning the, um, taking the responsibility of that engagement site, we managed to do five times, um, actually five times retention as compared to game industry average in our context. 
So that's one. Um, second thing is that um, instead of, and, and education games is not new as well, um, but how we have approached that and how we got our engagement numbers is really that instead of gamifying education, which means that you take what is you know, um, kind of taught in the classroom and you add some cute characters and um, um, music, right? And, and, and tell, tell the kids that it's a game. Um, and our kids, uh, they, they, they don't go to school that much, but they, they know what's a chocolate coated broccoli, right? So what we did is that we kind of, instead of ed gamifying education, we edutify games. So we look at game mechanics that already work, that they love, and then how do we integrate um, you know, education elements in it? So with that, we really um, got a very good engagement rate as well. Uh, and lastly, um, for uh, in our context, uh, everything is very uh, is very bread and butter. They can't. They don't, my beneficiaries don't have the uh, luxury to go to education just to gain knowledge, right? For them, uh, they need to see a direct link between education and employment. So um, for us, um, through learning um, on our app, we actually pull the skills that you have um, acquired into our employment platform, soft employment, and the. Um, the, our employers can see what you've learned so far and um, you know make the choices on you know um, uh, in employing them so I guess uh, that is uh, what uh, what I like to share for now thank you thank you it's clear that you are not wrestling but trying to solve the issue about how are you having in underprivileged people taking ownership of their own education right. right and that you have several tools of doing that let's move from Indonesia to Beijing Jim. Hi, can everyone hear my voice? Hi, my name, hi, my name is Jim. Thanks, uh, Arnold. Uh, to answer based on the format, um, I'm actually living in the Philippines, but um, business is based in Beijing and also in the US, so hopefully not impacted by the trade war. Um, <laughs> so the Joy v Edu I'm a, a co-founder and a partner at Joy v Education. We are a education consulting company. Uh, we have primarily three business lines. The first one is more along the traditional education consulting and counseling, primarily for high school students. The second line is more along um, workshops and also online courses, primarily geared towards helping students develop soft skills. And you know, as, as we know, in Asia Pacific, in, in China, in Beijing, Students are very much uh, into STEM courses. There are highly selective schools in, uh, in China that select students based on how well they participate in the math Olympiads. And uh, there's a, a significant gap and lacking in terms of how students develop their self-awareness, their communication skills, and their soft skills. And those skills are actually um, as important as the STEM skills as they go further along in their careers academically or in life. Um, the third area is that we also try to connect our students with opportunities to volunteer and work in um, NGOs and also social enterprise projects as well. And to, uh, so Arnold, to answer um, your second uh, question in terms of what we have um, tried to do to try to foster critical thinking, I want to um, actually take it back to something that Cameron mentioned earlier about educating the parents. I think that's um, we're all in agreement and consensus in terms of how institutional education or the way that um, we institutional education thinks can be failing us and also um, the way that parents think um, is at times outdated. You know, the, the, our parents um, were educated many decades ago and they have been influenced by the views of their parents and which in turn is influenced by their parents and it goes all the way back to the previous century or even more so. Um, one of the ways that we, um, we try to do this is to organize, um, has, has anyone um, heard of this thing called fuck up nights? It's a legitimate way for me to say the F word, uh, I think without offending anybody. Uh, so fuck up nights are a uh, event that started in Mexico City where entrepreneurs would gather together in meetings and they talk about how they effed up um, certain things that they did. Um, we tried to do something that's a little bit similar. We organized saloons in Beijing and in Shanghai and invited a lot of um, parents who are, you know, who sent, the parents of um, 
we're sending kids to some of the best public schools in Beijing and in Shanghai who are you know, expecting their kids to go to Harvard, to go to the top 30 ranked schools in the world. And uh, we, we, you know, we bring in um, people who are seemingly successful in their eyes, uh, but have effed up you know, many times in, in, in their lives. And one example was we, we brought in this, uh, he was the uh, former, uh, he was a Harvard grad, former um, uh, student government president at Harvard University. And he talked about basically the, the whole theme of, of his presentation to the, all the parents was how many times he effed up uh, trying to um, get enough votes at Harvard um, to become student president. And, and, and the theme is, you know, we, we, in terms of education, and again, going back to critical thinking, um, the need to really screw up and learn how to screw up and get up again, um, as opposed to learning based on grade point averages and based on um, a test score. I think this is an interesting point of view that you say that actually, I mean, stimulating critical thinking in some of our students is not just a simple job we have to do, but it's going against generations of traditions that we have to overcome and uh, how can we actually find ways of doing that. And secondly, I uh, hear a slight criticism on STEM subjects there, uh, that you think that soft skills are more important? No, it, I think it's a balance. It's a balance. You, know, you, you have, uh, obviously, you have the STEM skills, you have the math and the science, and then on the other hand, you have the emotional intelligence, where you have the, the, uh, the in, inherent um, IQ, where you, know, you have schools that essentially measure how s students are promoted and how students are ranked based on their math Olympiad scores. At the same time, um, the, if we look at the, you know, the, the trajectories of, of different students, um, how they succeed in life is also dependent upon how high or how they can develop their emotional intelligence, how they can develop their communication skills, how they can develop ability to work with other people. And that's um, not inherent in terms of just reading math and science. Okay, thank you. Last but not least, Ling. Thank you. So my name is smarter, Ling. Smarter me. Smarter yeah, me. We're looking forward to how to do that. Okay. Yeah. So I'm the CEO and co-founder of Smarter Me. My story began you know, two years ago because my daughter one day came back from school and asked us, why, why do we have to study geology? I, I don't even want to know about that. And my other daughter said, why can't we learn how to create games? I love to create games. And I don't know how many parents are there in this room, but if you have a tween or a teen who've ever told you that they wanted to be a YouTuber or a blogger or an influencer, you would know how much the world has changed. I mean, in Singapore itself, you know, it's reported that 21% of jobs will be gone in, trend in the next five years. But if you look at the education system, really, has it changed in centuries? And I'm not talking about the international schools, which has actually incorporated a lot more critical thinking, but really more of, the, let's say, the local, the government schools. Even in Singapore, where we are ranked top uh, in the OECD, you know, PISA measure, only 50% of the schools have coding taught and even so, it's only 10 hours a year and done and dusted, quota met, right? So that's when we decided to actually start up Smarter Me. So through Smarter Me, we actually equip kids with the, the K to 12 kids with the skill set, the mindset, and the heart set for the future. So through us, they actually learn coding, robotics, entrepreneurship, design thinking, and mindfulness. Now, why this mixture, right? There are a lot of coding schools in Singapore. There are a couple you know, in the rest of uh, Southeast Asia. But really, the two innovative things that we're thinking about, number one is really, should education be viewed as in silo? So this is a funny story. Um, I met a professor at a local university in Singapore, and he teaches entrepreneurship to university students. And I asked, so he, I asked him, okay, so what do you do in your curriculum? What do you teach? He said, um, financial model, go-to-market strategy, competitive analysis. Great. What about the entrepreneurial mindset? You know, what about the growth mindset, the resilience point that Jim was talking about, right? Failure. And he said, that's up to the psychology department. You know, if you're an entrepreneur, you realize that failure, resilience mindset, that is the core of entrepreneurship. It's not about the business. It's about how strong your will and your mind is. 
And that's why we decided really that, you know, when we teach all these future skills, it also cannot be in silo. You cannot have a kid learning just coding without knowing where am I going to apply those skills or just entrepreneurship and not knowing any bit about programming language or where even do I find a coder who can help me execute that problem, who can help me execute, execute that solution. So that's the first thing. The second thing is really real world relevance. And, you know, going through the system myself, I remember growing up and, you know, really, I was a straight-A student, so I excelled in the current academic system. But I remember thinking, you know, I was learning all about circuits, I was learning about um, the heart and everything. I had no idea where that fit in in my body, you know. So where does it fit in in the world that we currently live in today and of the future? So for us, when we teach all this, so just last week itself, we helped the inaugural Young Founders Summit, which is really a Shark Tank style competition in Singapore. We had 90 kids from six countries, so from India, China, Philippines, um, Malaysia, Indonesia, fly into Singapore and compete. And these kids, from as young as 10 years old um, to the oldest being only 17, they were pitching in front of a panel of investors. And what they were pitching was what you would see at you know, Startup Weekend or F Up Night um, or Shark Tank, really. These kids were coming up with such innovative ideas. You know, one came up with a recycling app. Her, their, their analysis or their problem statement was this. Most people actually do want to recycle. It's just that they can't be bothered finding a, a recycling bin. But if we could get a jo Gojek driver or a Grab driver to come to their house, pick up the recycled items, send it over to the recycling center, and that's where they get paid. Would people actually open up their super app, click on it, and request for it? And they went out to the market. Ten-year-old girls went out to the market, interviewed users. They came back and said, yes, there's a market for this. So when they came to Singapore and pitched, this was actually in partnership with a, um, uh, a VC fund over in LA who had mentors from UCLA. They flew over, they funded these guys, and the winners from Southeast Asia will actually fly over to LA next year to pitch for 50,000 US dollars. So to us, that's again it, right? We don't just provide education to kids, we provide them with hope. We inspire them to believe that they can actually change the world or save the world, right? As was earlier mentioned today. Uh, the second thing that we do differently is, so is, about, in a, is about corporate challenges. So I like very much what Ajit said about um, the internship in schools as well. Right now, a lot of, it's only university students who actually go for internships. But imagine this, imagine if the 12-year-old, 13-year-olds could come into a company and bring really fresh ideas. I mean, you know, so many of us corporates here or startups here, right, are always thinking about how do I speak to this user? How do I speak to the teenagers? If you're selling to teenagers, you, and you don't know how to speak their language, you don't even know what TikTok is, right? Then how are you selling to them? But if you got these teenagers into your company, they are your exact target market. They can go and do the user survey for you. They can go and do the UX for you. Or if your target market are their parents, they can go to their parents and do the UX study for you. Wouldn't that be amazing? Not just that. These are the future, right? They are the future generation. If they are in your company, they can see what the future is like for them. It would set them off on a clearer state, a happier state, much earlier on in life. I mean, we spoke to so many teenagers who are going through exams, going through schools, not knowing what they want to do in the future, but more worryingly, not knowing who they are and what they stand for. Um, so I'm going to stop there, but really that's what Smarter Me is trying to do. You're really about contextualizing the learning, uh, right? And putting it yes. in a larger context within a company, a little bit like uh, Ajit also pointed out, how can we bring practice and, uh, or the experience actually closer to the classroom or to the environment in which we learn. Before I go to the larger group, uh, I uh, would like to ask a question, and anybody who wants to answer is, is free to answer it, but uh, that is, we're trying all these innovations, uh, whether it's bringing in more efficient schools through metrics, whether it is um, making sure that we find ways of uh, uh, creating ownership, whether it is integrating technology with emotions and, uh, and, uh, and sort of the soft skills, the contextualization, communities as, uh, as, an, um, as an, a, a way of teaching, partnerships that we have, um, or, or 
embedding it in local cult culture and educating parents. We are all trying to uh, innovate uh, uh, in, in one way or another. Uh, what is the hurdles that we have to overcome? What are the difficulties that we have in, in innovating in this sector? Anybody who wants to, uh, uh, yeah? The first difficulty, or maybe I'd rather call it a challenge, is the research-based methodology we have for our methods. First, um, I think for biomedical researches, we need 50 case studies. But in this instance, we go around that because we are a private organization. So we work with private uh, companies and we don't need the, it's like, here's a problem, here's a solution. Let's work privately together and these are what we see. We sell the idea and then we test it out in a small group of students and if that works, then it's a go. Anybody else? Yes? Maybe me. Um, so I think, uh, so we, we all agree that teaching soft skills is very important, right? Um, but if we can't measure whether how effective we are, right, and, and in, the, in not only short term but um, in a long term way, how do we know what we're teaching is effective? I think um, measuring the success of teaching soft skills is really uh, something that um, I hope more people would research into. That's one. Um, and another thing that we are putting um, I mean putting our own um, neuroscientists and pedagogies into researching is how our brain learns through mobile devices because mobile device is going to be the piece of technology that the masses own right and how our brain learn in classroom environment versus on computers or versus mobile device is very different so um, I think um, that research area is still also quite nascent um, and um, I think that it really takes more universities right, to collaborate and um, research together. Ajit? Uh, I'll share an experience about uh, innovation and its challenges. I think you know we see all these things, uh, innovation coming up in Silicon Valley and all that stuff. You know, It's not that, uh, I think it goes back to life skills, right? I think we're seeing soft skills. The fact that in, in Asia, if somebody tries and it fails, you're almost like embarrassed that it didn't work out and all that stuff. So if we can, if there are people who really are, who embrace failure, I think innovation just automatically comes into place. I mean, I think culturally, Asia and West, that's the only difference. I mean, and we've, we've seen lots of experience in that. Can yes. I? I think the, the, fundamental understanding of uh, innovation is the fact that we are problem solving. And the challenge we see in, uh, in the age group of three to 18, or I would say five to 18 years is that students need to understand, they need to identify the problem properly. And in order to do that, we, we try to help them with many uh, professional tactics. Uh, so one of the things we do is we, form, we allow them to form quality circles. Uh, we, we do have an in-house entrepreneurship uh, program, but at the same time, it's, it's actually ground up created. So the quality circles of the students will actually take a live problem. Let's say if a parent is complaining about a toilet being not very clean on a particular day, they will go into the statistics, they will try and find out what the issue was. Was there too many students in that area for some soccer game or something? And that's why this thing happened. Uh, so they, they try to understand the fundamentals of what the root cause is. And based on the root cause, then they come back with ideas to fix it. Many of them are standard ideas, that's fine. But sometimes in, in many of these discussions, you find a, some sort of an innovative idea that actually comes up. And as you explained, students are there in, in all forms of excitement to create new ideas. And, and that's where we want to encourage them. We want that idea not to break off. Uh, a gentleman who heads a National Innovation Foundation told me once, he said there are 10,000 ideas generated, 9,999 are wasted. They never get implemented. Because we talk about it, we leave it in bucket. So we want these children to actually follow up on those innovative ideas. And we run boot camps uh, together with INSEAD. And we also try to give a lot of entrepreneurship opportunities to bring in 
real life real life investors to come in and suggest to them in terms of how to go about doing a business plan and how to take the innovation ahead so it's to really see our innovations be successful you need to encourage the students and motivate them at every single stage so that they don't see this as oh i've done it i'll pass it on to somebody and somebody else will do it so if they see that there is a complete a cycle of initiation of idea to a completion of an idea i think that gives them great motivation great confidence to really take up more complex challenges and more complex problem solving yeah so i think i'm going to approach this a little bit in terms of how can we innovate within the local government schools um, and in a primary and secondary school context because this is the place whereby resources are rather limited right and i think where really like so there's a story when we first approached the schools in Singapore the local schools in Singapore for their students to actually join young founders summit we got two major responses number 1 entrepreneurship is not our focus area this year maybe next year or the year after <laughs> so it's viewed like a project rather than an ongoing you know um immersion of the entrepreneurial mindset the second thing would be is this endorsed by the ministry of education right so and right, i think singapore right. yes yes so i can only speak for that context right um in that context so but i think the other thing really is because teachers do not have enough time there's already so many things that's going on within the curriculum that it's very hard for them to actually take out time to do r&d on their own accord in their own time um and actually pay more attention and do r&d in terms of what are the new technology what are the new apps that they can introduce in the class a lot of the onus on introducing innovation within the classroom context now lies on the teacher itself and so i think that you know singapore has done a, a good move recently because they've just taken away midterm exams for certain levels and free up 3 weeks of time for the teachers to do um, inquisitive based learning now the issue is the teachers currently do not know what that means so they are also trying to figure out how to fill that gap but also you know i've seen in certain schools how innovation actually take place is when they actually hire an external head of design and technology you know someone who has the autonomy to actually look specifically at innovative technology at apps that can be then be introduced within the school context and roll out to the students uh, another interesting news i saw lately was how and this just goes to prove how little resources teachers have at the moment how little support a lot of ad tech companies are starting to find influencer teachers so getting all these influencer teachers who have good followings to come on to try out their app and to promote it to other fellow teachers and what's in it for these teachers well the fact is that they get to use they get first hand advantage in terms of first mover advantage access to these apps um and they get to promote it and use it for free so it doesn't have to come out of their own pockets so i think if a little bit more resources can be given to teachers from the school perspective whether or not it's time maybe even paying them a bit of time during the holidays so that they can come together work and find good apps to be used or really allowing them more time to do more r&d in tech that would be one way to help innovate uh in the case of the philippines i think one of the challenges of the universities uh is going international because uh our regulating body the commission on higher education is demanding all the universities to go international or internationalize their curriculum and we all know that it's too costly and the uh, in the philippines also we want the, the private education institutions uh want to level the playing field however it's very hard to compete with state uh, colleges and universities because they are government funded as well as the locally funded uh, colleges and uh, schools whereas for private educational institutions we are heavily dependent on the tuition fees that our students are paying so that's i think part of the challenges but still we need to compete while well, at the same time um getting global and addressing all these uh, challenges in in the philippines yeah jim uh, so uh, to to answer the question and also to build on some of these discussions i uh, so two uh, two areas one in terms of mentality and mindset and also in terms of in, uh, on a more institutional level um from a mindset perspective um still going back to earlier to what cameron's point about educating the parents yeah. 
especially with K to 12, what we see is a big difference in terms of what the student or the, what the kid may want versus what the parent may want. Um, and in terms of you know, whether you're, you're innovating a solution uh, and trying to sell it to uh, the market, there's the, the student who is the, ultimately the user of the product or the solution, and then you also have the parent who is the gatekeeper and the one who actually makes a decision whether or not to adopt the solution. Yeah. And, and secondly, from a, a more institutional level, I want to build on what Lin said and also what uh, Jalen said as well in terms of measurements. You know, when we look at the institutional measurements, you know, in China, you have this thing called the Gaokao system where students have to take this exam, which determines what type of schools they, you know, they, they place in, whether it's Beijing University or a university somewhere else. In Singapore, I'm sure you, know, you guys also have the national exam in the US. SATs to ACTs, and part of that, you know, the reasons why they have the standard exams is actually goes back to the resource problem. There aren't enough resources to um, basically determine who gets gets where. So, so there's a there's a standardization process involved, and as long as the, the, the there's the institutional uh, in standardized ways of evaluation, people's goals are going to be aligned with that, and that's a. Uh, uh, what we do see as a potential big hurdle in terms of innovation, in terms of change. Yep. Yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm supposed to be on the panel, but I got in a bit late, so I apologize. But um, I am uh, a, the founder of Golden Path Academics, and uh, I represent uh, the host country here that you're here today. And um, we are an organization that operates in the after school and beyond school <laughs> space, and uh, we provide students with programs that help them develop 21st century skills. So basically critical thinking, problem solving, and um, collaboration, etc. cetera. Um, in Vietnam, we operate mostly um, in the urban areas, working with uh, private school systems and uh, directly with parents and uh, students. Um, and one of the challenges that I find in um, trying to introduce new programming into the education space um, is even though we are solving uh, a problem of you know, how rote learning and, and test-based uh, systems are creating these passive learners and people who are not quite ready for the workplace, we're still coming up against the priority problem. So if the education system and the public system here is very powerful, we have 15 million students and the majority of them are in public schools where the, the, the system and the policy is designed to generate uh, test scores that pass certain, certain uh, thresholds to get into the next levels. And, and so skills are not quite factored into that equation yet. And I, I think there is a little bit of effort to recognize that skills are needed in the education system, even though the workplace, in the workplace, everybody is screaming that we need to you know, educate, train skills, not knowledge. But in the education system, we're still testing for knowledge. And so the mismatch of those two kind of outcomes are creating the issue of where do we spend uh, time, like what do the students spend their time working on? And parents are worrying that they're not going to get the good grades and the passing the test, then they're not going to let them participate in activities and programs that actually develop their own competencies. And so, and so I think there needs to be a catching up um, process between the education system and the workplace, and then people like us in between are going to try to bridge that gap. And so here in Vietnam, we're seeing that, that there is a recognition, but not yet translated into policies and actual kind of mainstreaming of education programs. Do you think that this will come f first from the private sector or what, that the government will drive this? Uh, I'm sorry? Will the change that you are uh, proposing, proposing, will it first come from the private sector? Yes. Or, yeah, so so in, in Vietnam, it's mostly going to be private schools that are taking up this because they are ma more market-oriented, right? They respond to the parents and people who want that for their kids. And, um, but I don't yet see public schools really following suit in, with, with real kind of interest. It's more of uh, meeting the requirements that if any is, is in the policy, then we're going to check that box, but it's not a real investment from public schools yet. Yeah. 
um, you were talking about the challenges um, that exist. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed in terms of embracing failure in technology, students often are very good at this, and it's the parents that are not. Um, a big issue that we deal with in Miyama is tutors. Parents seem to feel there's a need for a tutor for just about everything. And that seems to lead to a complete lack of independence and the ability to work on their own, which uh, later becomes an issue in terms of universities. I don't know if that's um, in other countries that are a bit more developed. Maybe somebody could address that. I'll open it to, uh, yeah, I see somebody over there. Can you introduce yourself? Um, so my name is Tang. I'm from Vietnam too. Uh, I just want to add some, uh, some of the talk from uh, Hing sharing. So um, four years ago, I bring Fab Lab model to Ho Chi Minh City, and we foster innovation and critical thinking among the youth. Um, what we um, so we follow the Fab Lab of the MIT in uh, the U.S. and um, at first, we start our model is quite simple. So it's like a, we gather every youth that we can find on Saturday to discuss something. And they feel free to share anything that they want. And they can challenge each other. It's, there is no stupid idea. They just share it. And if we found something that interesting and we can do it, so we make it happen. It, it, it's like a... Uh, can you imagine that a cooker can use Facebook? So this is some of the idea that uh, some of the youth that they pop up. And four years ago, we make it happen. Such Im just imagine, uh, 15 minutes before you go to your work or you go to school, you just put the rice on the cooker and left to, uh, to work. And then 15 minutes before you come home, you just say, you just put the button. No, actually, you put some of the message on um, the website. And then the cooker automatically cook. And then when it's done, it send a message on Facebook, tag every member of your family, say that the ride is ready, come home, enjoy. So that is something that we make it four years ago. And it's come from a group of young energetic youth. And from my side, it's, it's like a, if, we, if we talk about the critical thinking and how to increase it, we should think about the environment where the youth feel safe and comfortable to share their own idea, to share their voice. And that is something that lack up in our education system where the teacher still say, hey, listen to me. I have something to say to you. And if you don't listen to me, your score is going to be low. And get what the students say. When the children come back to school, uh, to their house, their parents look at their score and say, hey, what happened? What did you do in school? Actually, did you learn or not? So this is something that we should pay attention to. Thank you. Any other reactions from the, from the attendants here? Any other questions? Yeah, I see two. Yeah. Uh, thank you for a very interesting discussion. My name is Abha Banerjee. I'm from India. And I was living in Indonesia for almost 16 years, and I just got back to India three months ago. And I also run an education company. I started the motivation industry in India in 2008. And, um, uh, when I hear about education here, I think there's a huge uh, misunderstanding about what education really means, and that needs to be addressed through all the things that we are doing over here. Uh, whenever we talk of education, and um, uh, you mentioned about traditional education, and then the, the people who are talking about non-traditional or new kinds of education, it's so directly connected to employment, uh, where... Uh, Tio was talking, uh, that we don't see anything else in it. I mean, it, it is supposed to be either career, it is supposed to be employment, it is supposed to be taking you ahead in, a, in one direction. It's so linear that we are not looking at other ways in which education helps us. Uh, so that is one of the factors that I think most educators should be uh, thinking of um, uh, incorporating in their own 
own whatever ways that education is needed for your own personalities as well. And that's where when you say parents, educating the parents, uh, parent leadership is more important. I mean, whether or not you understand what people are being, kids are being educated in, parents need to understand that the kids are being built. So we call ourselves a people building company because we understand that education and anything other than education which builds people is still people building. So I think that needs to be incorporated which is somehow uh, missing. Each time we talk of education, um, it, it's there in bits and pieces. But I think if that idea is, is sort of um, uh, uh, pushed through each time we talk about education, that we are, we are talking about ourselves and building ourselves at every stage, every step of the way, uh, parents would be able to see a different kind of education instead of pushing kids. In India especially, kids are committing suicides because I don't know, kids get 99.9% .9 marks. I don't know what they write in their papers. I want to see their papers. I mean, it's like, it's amazing. We used to get 60%. We used to be very happy when I was studying. So I'm, I'm amazed at uh, this. My kids are in school now and uh, I keep telling them to calm down. I mean, I'm, I'm the other kind of parent. I'm there like all over the place and I say, calm down, it's okay, it's okay. Uh, we'll, we'll figure what you'll do if you can't get 90. You know, so it's, it's, it's a different ball game at this point of time. Too much pressure, uh, too much happening in education, but I think still the clarity about what education can do for us apart from your career or employment is, is not being focused on. So that's something that I wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's an indeed an interesting <laughs> question to ask yourself what education is. And obviously it is building the person, but each of the stakeholders have a different role to play. Uh, parents, uh, the community, uh, the schools. Uh, we can't expect that all of these stakeholders do everything. So the building is actually a combination of many different things. Chef Ali. Good. Yeah. Oh. Hi, um, I'm not in the business of education, but I've been wanting to ask educators, how do you build discerning individuals? I've got some answers today in terms of quality circles to encourage innovation and a few other strategies. But still, if you could talk about how do you encourage students to think critically, especially in their secondary school years? We can discuss tertiary too, if that's okay with you. Anybody who wants to take that question? Oh, Jim. I, wanna, I actually want to, um, I'll try to answer this question while building up on uh, what this lady said. Um, actually, actually, I was, uh, many, many, many years ago, I did a brief internship in India, and in Rajasthan, and it's just amazing how parents would spend almost all of their lifetime savings to send their kid to this special school in Rajasthan so that they can have a shot at getting into one of the IITs. It's amazing how, uh, how education so, well, in education meaning the, the parents in the parents' mindset, they want to send their kids to the best school, even if it's a 4% probability. Um, but I, I want to do a shameless plug for, uh, since we, we've been talking about Indonesia, um, and this is not my own, my, not my own organization. Um, there's a school in Bali called the Bali Green School. Um, it, was, uh, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was formed many years ago by expats. Uh, my friend Chris Thompson was the uh, f former director over there. And uh, so to, to answer, uh, try to uh, attempt to answer the question about fostering critical thinking, what the Green School does is that they have a very non-traditional curriculum that is based on sustainability. We talk about, I think someone mentioned about environment, how environment is important in terms of um, education. And their entire curriculum is based on students um, really being more hands-on and being more environmentally aware. And what's interesting is that actually Chris, um, he and his team innovated a new program on top of the Green School that is about educating and helping the parents. So the parents actually got jealous when they, when they went to the Green School and in Bali and they sent their kids there and they f see this amazing sustainability-based, entrepreneur-based education and you say, okay, we also want to reinvent ourselves. How can we um, change our, try to change our mindsets and how can we do that? So I think the, the, there's a new initiative on top of the Green School that pretty much um, encourages the parents of the students to enroll so that the parents themselves can further develop their own design thinking skills, their own critical thinking skills. Um, I definitely encourage um, folks to check it out if you're ever in Indonesia, ever in Bali. 
Are there other examples that, yeah, Balangi? From a personal experience, when you innovate in the classroom, a lot of it will depend on the teacher about how open-minded they are. And in one instance, I had a group of um, 30 students and they were from different, uh, how do you call this, academic abilities. So the first question I would ask is, what is your dream? And they would have to list that down on a piece of paper. The second question that they, uh, that they have to answer is, how do you learn best? And so they, they would give me that. Then the third is, how committed are you into learning? So we use those three questions, the answers to those three questions, we use it in a way that the subject matter becomes a very personal experience for the student. And once they see that this is how I'm going to use it, okay, for instance, a specific example is I had a student, he hated biology, he's Japanese, he hates math as well. So I asked him, what is your dream? And he said, I want to become a chef. The second one is, how do you learn best? And he said, through art. So when I discuss certain concepts, I would use art to be the, the method about how he will learn. And because art is usually with hands-on experience, so I would give them, and him particularly, things that he can use, he can touch and see. Then I would ask him how he felt, how, um, how, do, how does he think he will use this kind of situation. When it came to the standardized testing in Japan, I was surprised that he topped the math and the biology, um, how do you call this? Yeah, exams. So I hope that answers your question, ma'am. If I can quickly yes. add. Um, so our basis, right, is to teach ours, because it's independent learning, right? So we train them on how to learn. And you can't really learn how to learn if you are not critical, right? If you can't think, you can't really pick up new skills. So one of um, our uh, kind of advisors uh, uh, does, uh, Professor Sugata Mitra, what he does is he does uh, self-organized learning environments and he creates things like that. Um, what this means is that instead of um, in, in science classes um, teaching, okay, this is uh, water freezes at zero degrees and you know, um, boils at 100 degrees and things like that, uh, or what, how, what, how does condensation work, he turns the situation around right, and asks the kids, okay, so um, you know, what, this is a cold can of Coke, right? Why is the Coke sweating? Can you find out the answer? Right, and the kids will be, um, I don't know what's the answer, and his answer to them is, well, can you go find out? So then the kids kind of organize themselves into groups of three or four, and come up with their own answers, debate with each other, present to each other, and then, you know, as, uh, as a whole class, come, come to the conclusion. So that is a kind of a first step to, that I see really effective in teaching critical thinking. So how do we get, um, instead of, you know, really passive learning, right? Getting the students themselves to take ownership of their own learning and, and discover, you know, the answers on their own. Your question elicited a lot of reactions. Uh, Atul also has some. <laughs> uh, no, I think the challenge in structuring the entire critical thinking is how do you put this into a structured form where it doesn't become teacher dependent and generally, if everything is teacher dependent, then you don't have a process. So what we did is uh, we took a simple concept of project-based learning. And so essentially, if the teacher in the lesson plan has a certain set of critical thinking ideas to be implemented, she would actually go and dig a, she or he would dig a project and give a project to the students. Maybe it's a summer project, maybe it could be a weekend project. And, and the whole idea is that they can work on it, they can work collectively or individually and find and, and be able to stress their minds to be able to think critically. So we've used that to a lot of extent uh, and we've seen a fair amount of success in that. Yes, Cam. Um, critical thinking is starting to be um, integrated into the curriculum. Um, both advanced placement, IB, um, definitely are including this. With the IB program, uh, students are required to do an extended essay, and research projects are integrated into the courses. 
and often they're open-ended types of questions. Uh, within the events placement, the same thing is occurring. The questions are more con um, conceptual. The calcul I'm a calculus person, and the calculus that I took as a student is not the calculus that we teach. Um, the problems are applications, and the students have to apply the mathematical um, calculations into the context of an application. Um, also, teachers are now using uh, projects, and even the standardized testing, which is done by uh, Northwestern, the MAP testing, um, now includes a lot of um, conceptual okay. problems. I'm going to take one more a question from the room or a comment from the room, but I will warn the eight participants that I will ask you the question uh, to answer me then in maximum one minute. What are you going to do different after this discussion? Right? Uh, you can reflect on the question. Uh, is there any other comment from the room? Yeah? I hope this doesn't take the conversation in the wrong direction now, but I'm quite struck by the last few comments, particularly Cameron's comments around what constitutes um, critical thinking, which is, I think, is coming down to a definition around problem solving and so on, and being creative in that problem solving. But I wanted to introduce just another aspect of critical thinking which hasn't been picked up in the room so far, and I think that's to do with um, uncertainty, ambiguity, um, and complexity, really, that um, many of the problems that our students, whether we're talking about um, year five, year 10, or tertiary students um, face, are actually problems to do with ambiguity and uncertainty and complexity. They're not just to do with solving the problem, for example, of why does a can of Coke have um, water on the outside of it, or, uh, and those sort of STEM problems. And so, um, in thinking about where we're going with all this, um, I hope that our curriculum will actually uh, introduce people to the problems that uh, our world faces as ambiguous problems, not just uh, solvable problems. Yeah, I think that's an interesting idea. Ambiguous problems, not solvable problems. Ladies and gentlemen around the table, I'm going to give you the task. What are you going to do differently after having heard this discussion? Is there something actionable that comes out of it? Uh, Ajit, thanks for uh, willing to It's an easy one. I think I'm going to teach the parents something also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Can I go around the table? Ling, what are you going to do differently? So I think um, I'm just going to answer. So I didn't mention parents because that's something that, you know, we can talk until the talk cows come home and we won't be able to solve this in this room. But something that was mentioned by this gentleman over there, which is the ambiguity part. So one of the things that we actually teach is design thinking. Now this is a relatively, it's a relatively new buzzword to certain, you know, to certain people. Uh, but essentially that's what it is, is that how do we think about solving problems without having a clear answer? Because the problem that you are facing, it could be, you know, how do I make this bottle of water better? Depending on who your user is, the answer to that is very different. So with that in mind, it's not even an engineering-based kind of decision-making or critical thinking or problem-solving process, but it's a very human-centered problem-solving process, which I think therein lies a lot of ambiguity and uncertainty, and everyone, every child will come up with a different answer. If, if one thing for sure, I would think that as we approach education, and that's something that we're going to focus on a lot more as well, is that we need to involve the kids in this. We can't be solving education for them, standing from a teacher or a parent point of view. And, you know, as we've been running Smarter Me, one thing that struck me really, really deeply to the core is that as much as we seek to inspire them, most of the times, they inspire us. And how can we bank on, on that and encourage that a lot more? Thank you. Good now. For, for Vietnam, I think that uh, policymakers are still the one who's going to have a lot of influence into how we move, our system is moving. And um, but as much as I want, I have not yet done enough uh, of a job of engaging them in that dialogue. <laughs> and so um, I think we need to engage more with them. Yeah. In my case, I will be meeting with the parents and we will be putting a lot of the work of the students online 
but then there will be a data privacy thing that we will have to encounter because I want them to have a repository of what they have thought at this age and then we will be tracking that. So once they are of age, maybe to change their life course, they will be able to look back and see how far have I gone and where am I going. Harry? Uh, as for me, uh, I learned a lot from this session. Actually, I took down notes, and, but I still stand to my proposition earlier in forging academic alliances uh, among Asian nations. And I just hope that we will continue to be united as, and be one as a team where we will be ensured of our aspirations uh, enunciated, today, enunciated today in Horace's will be aptly realized. Thank you. Uh, a short, short uh, suggestion and uh, what we would like to do differently is really give every student a chance to innovate you know, every, every year or during every term and uh, really make them feel happy about the fact that they've achieved some innovation. And I think that, that feeling and that experience and exposure is going to be going a long way for the student to come up with new challenges. Janine. Uh, so it's interesting that everybody seems to be talking about um, involving the parent. Uh, so the way that we came up with our solution was actually we told the teenager in Jakarta and the teenager in Bandung and suddenly over a week we have a hundred teenagers wanting to learn through play, right? And we created our product ground up of with just the teenagers themselves. And of course, um, uh, we, we have parents wondering what the teenagers are doing with this game-like looking thing, right? So uh, it, it's really a good reminder. And, and, and in my context, a lot of times that parents are the one that uh, has, is the barrier to education, right? Um, they're the one who makes the, the children work, right? And so on. So um, it, it's just a really good reminder that I need, uh, we, we need to not only uh, um, you know, educate their, their, our beneficiaries, but also the parents. And this, another thing is, um, I, I'm, what I really like is um, now there is a lot more emphasis on soft skills, um, you know, and critical thinking skills. So uh, we, we, I think we need to do, you know, more work on that. Um Definitely, I think I'd be looking at the integration of soft skills into the curriculum. And I really like the idea of looking at schools, education, people building. Chip? I think it was a, that was a great point you made about people and students needing to learn how to deal with ambiguity. That was a great point. Um, and just to build on that, and also on your point earlier about the future of work, uh, one thing that we, I would love to do, because parents and students, all, they are, um, they frequently ask me and some of my colleagues, what should I major on? What should I study? I would love to build a workshop or talk about ambiguities around the future of work and how can we deal with that as students. Um, I was supposed to summarize this thing that's in my brief that I got from uh, Horasis. Um, this was a very rich discussion and I have eight points that I wrote down. Now that's far too many, eight, but it's a lucky number, so uh, maybe we can do something with it. The first, and it's not in order of importance, I have to say. It's more in order that it occurred during the discussion. But the first word that I would like to mention is partnerships. We can't do it alone. Whether it is partnerships on an international level, partnerships with communities, partnerships between schools. Education is about partnerships because it's building the person and we need to fully embrace partnerships in this new form of education that we are looking for. Secondly, it is obviously clear that um, uh, education is becoming, thanks to the mobile uh, devices that we have, it's ubiquitous, it's everywhere. You actually have your student available all the time. Uh, there was a time that students came to a classroom and by the time that the bell was ringing or whatever, they forgot completely about what, uh, what was going on. Now, because they are all the time connected, you can actually reach out to them all the time. There is probably a trade-off to be found between ubiquitous uh, education and stress that will create it through it, but at least it's opening an opportunity to all the time educate. 
The third one is, of course, that when we look at focuses, uh, the different forms of delivery, we think about immediately about technology. But some, somehow a discovery for me in this discussion is that this, this technology is not going to work unless there is a very strong investment in ownership, taking ownership by the user, by the student, and that we need to also, also ensure that we contextualize uh, what we deliver through that, that, um, that technology. Fourth point that was very strong in this discussion, it came up from Ajit, it came up from Ling, it came up from several people around the table, is that we need to go much more experience-based. It's not about a sage on stage uh, sharing knowledge, but it's about giving our uh, benefic beneficiaries of the, uh, of the education the opportunity to do things, to experience. And your example of the coca bottle with uh, the, the sweat on is an interesting example, your, your uh, quality circles, etc. But it's all about experience-based learning. The fifth point that came very strongly out of, that, of the discussion for me is that in this part of the world, affordability is a very big issue. And affordability uh, will come from uh, yeah, maybe finding funds to help us uh, through scholarships and bursaries and things like that. Uh, but it actually is also about rethinking how we organize our education. Uh, and you uh, were talking about making it measurable, but uh, I think the focus was really, and that's my sixth point, it's really about rethinking our education processes. Uh, rethinking about what is it that we do to create an educational environment. And that's where I would put that, con that element of ambiguity, working on amb ambiguous problems. It fits a bit in experiential learning, it fits a bit in this idea of let's rethink about what the processes are. The seventh point that for me comes very strongly out of this discussion is the focus on the, on the student whether it's the kid that you were referring to, or whether it's the adult learner uh, that other people will look at. But let's focus on the, whether it's what you spoke about, the, um, the, um, the needs for skills here in Vietnam, uh, and, and, and making sure, sure that we really provide the skills that are, n that are in line with what uh, employers want, or the, where you, when you were talking, um, about uh, the fact that you, that you're this, uh, this, this uh, unprivileged kids that they actually, when they learn something, they need also to show something to a potential employer about what they have learned. Let's focus on the, um, the beneficiary of the education, whether that's a kid, a kid or an adult learning. And my eight point that I have is, if we want to re really dis the, the sort of shape this new educational system that responds to the needs of society that I referred to in the beginning, we will have to be disruptive. We will have to go against generations of traditions, generations of parents, generations of philosophies and research-based uh, methodologies that you were referring to. We will need to uh, have different ways of measuring the effect of soft skills, uh, etc. We actually are in a very disruptive environment and we will need to do a lot more research on how we go, are going to go against tradition. I think this was a very rich discussion. Thank you very much for uh, uh, having sat through it and have helped uh, the discussion. And I am exactly on time. Thank you very much. <laughs>